Good evening, everyone. So today I'm going to present this book. It's called The Selfish Gene. So this book is written by a very famous scientist, Richard Dawkins, because of this book, due to his book, and then he explained, he explained the evolution biology, and he tried to explain what does it mean by the selfish gene. So before I go any further, I want to ask, clarify that the selfish gene, the title, does not describe the gene that creates an organism who is selfish. Okay, because even the the author himself, he repeatedly emphasized that he regret to use this title. Actually, he thinks that the immortal gene would be would be more suitable. Which one? The immortal gene. Immortal gene. Yeah, the immortal gene. Because he because he find that you know the selfish gene, everybody would think that okay, the gene creates an organism who is selfish. But it's not his intent. Actually, he wants to in describe the gene that a gene it behaves in a selfish way so that the gene would survive and replicate and become numerous in the population. So as we know that in the evolution biology the theory is the survival of the fittest, right? Survival of the fittest. So in order to become fit in the nature, so we would assume that first we, we want to get as much resource as we can. So in the expense of other people. So if we are selfish, right, so we would intuitively think that a selfish organism would have more chance to success because he cares only himself. He doesn't care about anything, right? So he takes all the resource, he occupies all the resource there and then he can replicate and reproduce the organism. But we see that in nature there's a lot of altruism, altruistic behavior in nature. So for example, in the vampire bat, so if one of them had a full meal in the night, they would feed some food to the other bats, they are starving, they don't get the meal. And also in birds, they, they would help its companion to remove the ticks on their head because they couldn't get onto the head, right? So the question is that these behaviors cost them energy, and this behavior doesn't give the one who, who is the giver any benefit at all. So why still they display this kind of behavior? So these are the questions that kind of par paradox in the theory and the Richard Hawkins tried to explain this in using the game theory. So let's go to the game theory. So game theory is the study of mathematical models of conflict and cooperation between intelligent rational decision makers. So it's not like physics and chemistry because in physics and chemistry the law is strictly defined, the law is very narrow, but in game theory they study the adaptive response of agents in a dynamic environment. So and it is mainly used in economic psychology and to illustrate the game theory, the famous the famous example is a game called Prisoner so, uh, Dilemma. Uh, have you come across irrational people in your life? Irrational people in your life. Yeah. So this will not work with that, right? Then Yeah. So I don't know how but you know there's another book called Misbehaving, right? I think they will I think they will explain the rational decision mm. more detail. And I think Swati is reading that. Yeah. yeah. But here is more in the context of evolution evolution biology, not in the context of economics. So um, let's go back to the game. So this is a game we, they call Prisoner's Dilemma. So the game is that two prisoners are arrested and imprisoned in different rooms. These two prisoners, they don't have the means of communication, okay? They cannot talk to each other. They are imprisoned in different rooms, separate rooms, and then the prosecutor would ask each of them to, pretend, to betray each other in the exchange of lesser prison sentence. So if we look at this um, payout matrix, we saw that the red color, the red color represents one of the prisoner and the black color represents one of the prisoner. So if we see that if both of them are defect, if both of them de betray each other, both of them would get three years of sentence, the jail sentence. But if both of them cooperate with each other, they just they both will get only two years of sentence. So in this case, we will see that the the best situation would be 
cooperate and cooperate. But the thing is, if you choose to cooperate and then the other prisoner choose to defect, you will get four years, but he only get one year. So it's vice versa. So here is the thing. So which card would you choose? Would you choose to cooperate or defect? Who choose cooperate? Who choose defect? Come on, guys. Come. Cooperate. But you don't have other means to see what other people would do. Do you still choose so, to cooperate? So let me give you a real world situation, right? Uh, 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 have you heard of uh, American legal system called plea bargain? Yeah. Plea bargain. Right? So what, what happens there, right? You are supposed to uh, tell on you know other person who was involved in the crime. So you get less sentence than the other person. Does. So that's really not corporate, right? So um, in in US at least, what happens is that large number of cases result in plea bargain. Okay, not on you know saying okay, I will not tell you anything that might um, convict my partner. Okay. So um, the reality is that there is more of this thing. In if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. the case is that of defect, not of uh, one person defecting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think in this case, benefit will be benefit, right? Yes, so let me explain this. So we know that there are so many nice people in, the, in this room, <laughs> but if we analyze the situation rationally, actually, defect is the dominant strategy. Why? Why? Because if you look at, if you look at other people's decision, if the red choose corporate, you will see that defect would give you lesser sentence. Right, that's negative to Whosoever defects first gets a benefit. In this case. Huh? Yes. In this case, yeah. whosoever defects first. In reality, though, uh, prosecutor will give you chance only to the lesser of the important person. So uh, here, uh, again, the things are made too simple, very simplistic, yeah. in that both of them have the same uh, chance of, uh, you know, uh, and both of them are equally important or whatever. Both of them have equal chance to. Defect as an example in the yeah. legal team is position. In reality, uh, the, the, this will be biased, and the only choice is uh, for one of them, the one you know where uh, the person of lesser value, he can defect if he wants to. Otherwise, uh, they are forced to um, be into the defect defect game. Or well, I don't know what do you call it. I don't know whether you call it corporate so, so corporate the, defect. The assumption is called symmetry symmetry game theory. Symmetry means that both of them are equally important. So they also have the research on asymmetry one, but mm. in here we are just assuming the asymmetry because it's easier. So, but um, in this game, we will see that the defect is the dominant strategy because no matter the other player choose defect or corporate, if you choose defect, you would get the lesser, lesser juice sentence, right? But the Richard Dawkins want to say that this game is a simple game where it only plays just one time. But in nature, it doesn't look like this. In, na the, in nature, it is more complex where you know two species would have multiple times to interact with each other. So he comes up with another version of the game called Iterated Prisoner Dilemma. So in this game, so um, I changed the payout matrix a bit. So before that, it's negative. Before the matrix is negative. But right now, I just changed the matrix into positive, and the M is to get more score as possible. But in iterated prisoner's dilemma, it allows the players to play the game repeatedly. So and in these iterations, the iterations make the game com complicated and it makes the game unpredictable because in each iteration, two players they will build up their trust or mistrust or you know they they would um, forgive or you know they will take revenge in the another iterations. So um, there is another sci the political scientist called um, Robert Axelrod. He runs a competition of this game, and then he advertised to the expert and asked the expert for the strategies to play these games. So there are 15 strategies submitted from the 
different scientists and they come up with several strategies to play this game. So these are the list of the strategies. So the first one is the random strategy where you know the the one um, the agent would just play the corporate or defect randomly and they set this as the baseline. And then there is other strategy as well like the for the tit for tat it's always play corporate. But if the other players play defect, then it will take a revenge by play defect in the next round. And then they have night prober, they play corporate, but once in a while it plays defect cards. It's just random. Then we have remorseful prober. So this is because we said that the remorseful is something like the second and the third strategy. But if it plays defect to other, it, it would allow the other to play defect for to him once and he won't retaliate. So the grudge is it always plays corporate cards, but if it betrayed by the opponents, then it would just play the defect cards from now on. It won't forgive the opponents. And then we have the always defect, always corporate, and we and they have any other um, strategy as well, which is very delicate in the statistical or Bayesian theory to do that. But they found that one the most successful strategy is one of these. It's the simplest one. So, mm, who do you think, which one do you think that it is the most successful strategy here? The first, the first one? The second one? Okay, the third one? The fourth one? The, the fifth one? So who thinks that the fifth one is the most successful strategy? Those people. How about the sex in seven? So the always corporate, we, we will say that this is the most naive agent because it's always great corporate. It's the nicest kid. But in for the result comes up, they found out that the most successful strategy is the second one. This for that. So after they do the analysis, but you know the interest. The point here is that you can, in in many practical game, you only the first one to defect the benefits. The second one doesn't have any benefit. The second one. And so retaliation doesn't uh, affect your opponent. Once once the opponent has already defected, mm. oh, sorry, once the other person has already defected, your retaliation or your changing. From uh, uh, you know, uh, corporate to defect won't ha won't affect that person at all. Yeah, you so you have to be the first one to defect if you want to benefit. Yeah. So so suppose suppose I change the uh, <coughs> game uh, in a more practical way. So mm -hmm. it's just again giving the example of regal system. Mm -hmm. Only one of the two g gets any benefit of defection in your strategy, right? Mm -hmm. in a, you know, minus one. Or minus four, only one of them can do that, this one. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the other one, wh whatever other one does, uh, would not matter to that other one. Other one will always have the high cost. Yeah. So, this so is the only problem. the first one to defect has the benefit. And in that case, uh, I don't see it for that would work. No, actually, it works. Is because you have to because the the game how does it play is it not it 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 would use the strategy to play with every other strategy. So it will, it will, um, they, will, they will play the game of one strategy versus every other strategy. So from the score they get, they get for each round, they sum it up and then they found that the higher, the one that get the highest score is this strategy. So why? Because if the one they play defect would get highest score, it doesn't it doesn't work in the long run. Because if we see that in this pair matrix, if you cooperate like both both nice strategy, they cooperate at every turn, definitely they would get the highest score if you know the one they always play defect. And this is the interesting finding they find that the strategies that perform well have the following properties. First is the niceness. So if you don't have any other information, you always choose to play corporate. And but you don't just play corporate all the times. You also need to have the ability to retaliate. So if 
you get betrayed by others, you betray others as well. And not only that, you also have to be forgiving. That means if other people start to play corporate with you, then you continue to play corporate card. Even they betray you once. So this is why, so this strategy, this is why the grudge doesn't work at, at here. Because even though sometimes the remorseful problem, they, they are sorry for what they did, but if you choose to keep playing defect cards on them, you still get a low score. So this shows this shows that why we have this altruistic behavior in the nature is because you know you if you if the vampire bat had a very full meal, it saved his friends, but it knows that when it doesn't get any food, he, his friends will save him by feeding their food. And also in the birds, you know that because every bird they are unable to remove the ticks from its own head. So helping each other is the best way to get rid of the ticks and you know prevent the disease transmitted by the ticks. So this is why um, they they observe this altruistic behavior and the and it says that this is the product of evolution. It's because if iterated prisoner tarimas we shows that the good the good behavior actually gives you the most benefit. So even though the the gene the gene is selfish in the way that it wants to reproduce and replicate in the population, but somehow the organism that it creates actually displays this altruistic behavior. So this is why um, he used the game theory to explain this. And we show that um, in AI we have this genetic algorithm who uses you know who uses this as analogy and try to find the computer programs that have the highest fitness. So the highest fitness means that the computer pro program that could um, fulfill the task most efficiently and after the generations. And this is the one that I found a few days ago. That I think it's I think it's Stanford they use the artificial intelligence to solve some problems. To let this um, this avatar to run through the mess. But um, in this book, it says that a winning strategy is not necessarily a stable strategy. So he um, he introduced this concept, evolutionary stable strategy. So what does it mean by stable means that the strategy it cannot be invaded by any other alternative strategy when it is numerous. So in order to clear more easily illustrate this, let's put the score of defect defect into 3-3, three, three. right? So we would know that either you play corporate corporate or defect defect, both of them get the same score. So in this case, we was, in game theory, they would say that the Nash equilibrium is these two conditions. But there is only one evolutionary stable strategy here, which is the defect defect. And why is that? Because we know that if you play corporate corporate, right? You only get the highest score if other play corporate, but if other play defect, you get less score. <coughs> but if both play defect, defect, you it, you won't matter that other play defect or corporate because you still get the highest score no matter what they do. So in this case, the de both defect, defect is the pure ESS. Right. So let's go back to the iterative prison that is my game. So Richard Tokin said that the tick for test strategy is not an ESS. Why is that? Because it could be easily invaded by other nice strategy. So we know that there is one strategy called always corporate strategy, who is the, the most naive strategy that always play corporate. And because this strategy doesn't play defect at all, so tick for tech would not retaliate. They would just play corporate from from the beginning to the end. So in this case, we will say that the tip for test strategy can easily be invaded by the always corporate strategy. So they found that um, they found that in this case there is no true ESS in this game. In in fact, they they, they describe the condition called collectively stable strategy, where it is possible for more than one strategy to be collectively stable at the same time. But that. As you said, both corporate and defect strategies are equally good. Uh, you know, the, there is no other reason 
no reason other than that score that matters in choosing corporate or uh, defect, right? There's no other property that is of important. Important. That's why they are. It doesn't matter whether it goes to yeah. corporate or right. It doesn't matter, but because in nature there are mutation offers. So if a population is rendered by always corporate strategy, if a population has half of T of that, and then half the always corporate strategy, if somehow if this another strategy comes called always defect, so the always corporate would be invaded by the always defect strategy. They would get exploited. So somehow it says that the in nature. There is no highest or the best strategy, but there is an equilibrium between different strategy in the population. So um, when I look at this, so I think of about how we do our machine learning research nowadays. Okay, so what we do is we usually we build the model and then we train the model and then we select the one with the highest accuracy and use that. So this paradigm, this research paradigm, um, lies one underlying assumption, which is that you know there is one model that can fulfill our task, that can fulfill our goals. But <coughs> we can see that in nature, it doesn't work like this. Um, in nature, every system has this tolerance for fault. That means there are fault tolerance. They can be more robust. And because, why is that? Because of the diversity. Not because of they are the strongest or they are the best, but because of the diversity that makes the species can survive long. Um, to, to illustrate that, I come up with this example. So, I know that this dress is very popular two years back because you know half of the population sees that it is white gold and half of the population sees that it is blue black. Yeah, but I see it as white gold. Who sees it as white gold? <laughs> so the blue black? Yeah, see, we can see that. But, um, side, um, cognitive scientists found that why people perceive differently is because um, for the for those who see it in white gold, they perceive the picture to be captured under the white sun environment. So because the environment is under the bright condition, so they would have they will counter the, the effect of the yellow, the white color, and then they will see it as white gold. Mm -hmm. But for those who see it has blue black. They perceive the picture to be captured under artificial light setting, so it's in the indoor room. So this is the phenomenon called color constancy. But mm -hmm. what, what? I can't see white gold there at all. You <laughs> see blue black? No? You see blue black color? Yeah, I don't see white gold. I see white gold. Which one is white, you see? Which part is gold? The blue one is white. This is white. Yeah, that's gold. white. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not really guys. Yeah, yeah, you see white gold. So this is the this is the popular picture two years back. So what does this shows is that even in the same visual human perceptual system, according to the different settings, our perceptual system comes up with different results. What do you mean by different settings? Different settings mean that do you perceive the picture is captured under which environment? Is it captured outdoor or captured indoor? But, uh, so, we have a person picture as it is in the slides, right? So yes, yes. So, according to the environment that you perceive, your perceptual system do the modification and then comes up with different results. Yeah, but I can, I, I see the same color even if I try to perceive it yeah. in yeah, the different yeah, environment. Yeah, that's yeah. I also have the same problem. I, I can't yeah. see, uh, there's no, I'm trying, but I can't see what going on. This one huh? So once, once it is said that uh, it is white gold, you can't change it back. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, no, the, so we have a picture, uh, for example, uh, on perception that Corey's talk has, mm -hmm. you know, the face, and and that you can, you know, think carefully and you can change it, you know, you can see different perspectives, but here I'm not. And looking at the background, actually I tried to perceive it under the Indoor, I still cannot perceive it under indoor. Mm. I still see just white gold. Yeah. So, so, the question. so, white gold means white and gold, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not pure white. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's not pure white. white. It's actually yeah. and gold. blue is black, white, and gold. Yeah. yeah. Blue is uh, white yeah. and uh, black. Uh, sorry, gold. And gold. In blue and I said, yeah, blue and black. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. the background is. Uh, 
I perceive it as overexposed. Yeah, it is yeah. overexposed. Yeah. So I chose this example because I want to see that um, just like what Richard Dawkins said, the nature has evolved the organism to be fault tolerant by um, modified uh, adaptive in different environment that would make different decisions. But if we look at the machine learning research right now, we only have one model. We just choose the highest model and to do all this, um, to do the prediction. That's why it comes out, we said that, you know, somehow the machine learning cannot reach 100% accuracy. And this might be the reason. Well, no, so, so, so uh, just like there is a, you know, distance between open world and closed world uh, mm -hmm. thing, computations, or uh, whether, you know, whether there's a one baseline or multiple baseline, whether there is a um, fact versus relative uh, findings. And uh, what do you do with relative find findings? So uh, you were given a data and you are asked to find some insights from the data by finding the pattern. But it's all under the assumption there's one singular interpretation. Right? Where is the scope of baselining it with different things that are humanistic? Let's say your cultural bias, your uh, you know bias of you know your concept of let's say beauty, which is different from culture to culture, from individual to individual, and all that, right? So what is you know how would you do that, right? Uh, yes, you can possibly say we are doing majority bias kind of stuff, but uh, that you know we don't know really. We might be doing what we may be saying. Majority, but actually we may be doing dominant. Let's say, suppose again, we talk about concept of beauty. Maybe we are uh, just biased, being biased by uh, the concept of beauty for the people who are able to pay for fashion, which may be minority people than the people who are not able to pay for fashion, which may be majority people, right? So um, there are these. Uh, stuff that I don't think we've been talked about when you're talking about uh, really getting insights from data. The, the reference points, that, you know, there is, there is no discussion of that uh, capturing that, right? Well, that's why we have the, we have multiple labelers and then we find the agreement of them using different techniques and then we even have to, we have to defend those techniques by which you found an agreement. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's, even the ground truth labels are something that are that are different from yeah. different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see both. You can Why? see both. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible that you you have a higher mm -hmm. higher <laughs> level of you know. Uh, what you might call perception, perhaps you are you are able to uh, you know. But also something strange happened because Lisa is uh, searching the pictures of this one, and I just looked at it, and I just uh, looked back to the slides, and I just saw the gold. Before that, I just saw the blue and black. Uh -huh. And after that, I just see the picture that how the gold looks like. Mm. It's just gold for me. Mm. But if you search Google, there are a lot of picture that they try yeah, to modify the color is. using Photoshop yeah. to so become more look really differently. No, this also to me still looks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, if we open that screen, would it look different as well? Mm. Is it connected? Okay. Okay. So this is the first. And another part of this book that I found interesting is the use of meme. So this is another interesting chapter in this book. So meme is the term that comes from Richard Dawkins because he wants to have some words that have that rhymes with gene. So he coined this word meme, and he says that just like gene, meme is a replicator. 
and then how they survive, they survive through imitation, spread through the brain, and it's in responsible for our cultural transmission. And for the memes, he goes on with um, give this example saying that for this song, Odd, Odd Lang Syne, the actual lyrics is the four Odd Lang Syne. This is the actual lyrics. But somehow, after right now, people sing, people sing this lyrics for the sake of Odd Lang Syne. So he's, he theorized that um, why people sing this is because the S and the K sound is more obtrusive. So if one person sings the erroneous lyrics in a group is easily heard and learned by those who are not sure of the lyrics. And that's how these lyrics they spread through the population. Now people sing this this erroneous lyrics. So just like the gene, the mean will compete with its rival mean. That means that an interesting idea or the gossip will spread more quickly and more efficiently. And so now I think that is it possible that if we can make a chatbot to learn to determine which one is meme. Could it be more interesting, you know, in such that you know? Because I know that um, I tried to chat with my Alexa once. I said Alexa, chat with me, and then the Alexa doesn't know what to chat with me. He would ask, she would ask, what do you want to talk about, right? That means you have to throw um, throw a narrow example for her. So I just said a country name. I just said okay, let's talk about Singapore. But the information that she gave me is very boring about Singapore's population, how much area, how much. But this is not what we talk, right? We human talk, we just talk about the, the interesting thing, you know. We just talk about, oh, you know, Singapore has a very strict law for what, what your friends did in Singapore and what is the interesting about Singapore. So, you know, so I think that, you know, if we can somehow determine the meme, so maybe we can build an interesting chatbot. But I know that this is not easy because even humans, we still don't know how do we determine something is interesting and how do we determine something is not interesting. And I came across with this um, cognitive scientist. So he published a book last year called The Evolution of Mind. So what he theory is that just like we look at the gene as if the gene behaves in a selfish way, but we know that the gene doesn't think. A gene doesn't have consciousness. He also think that actually our consciousness just arise from this mindless evolution. So I just captured some some snippet from the article, but actually I don't know what he means in this course. And I'm, I think I I want to make I want to read this book at at, at at my next reading target. So this is a he is a good co-worker with, you know, he's a good friend with this Richard Dawkins and his book actually most of them is um, talking about memes and how our consciousness evolve. So that's the end of my presentation. Well, that's short and sweet. Religions, you know, could is it be, is it possible that we make the machine more adaptive? You know, um, like the, the, depending on the environment that they are in, they will come up with different conclusion. Yeah. So, so in in situations uh, in a, uh, game theory, really frames some past aspects of human decision making. And uh, to the extent that machine can uh, compu you know, make the same kind of decision that humans would make when faced with those situations, well, to the extent, that extent, this is very relevant, very interesting, right? Um, you do get to, um, um, you do get to ask these questions. Uh, uh, if the game theory is framed in the context of rational decision making, what do I do? What if I win by being irrational? Right? So um, the idea here is that um, you know uh, the current president is always talking about making a deal. Right? 
and it's always interest, it's interesting from what people say, I would say, winning. Right? It's more important to win. You know, it's not important whether you win in a right way or not. It's not important, right? So what if that is the that is the objective? Now what would you do? And to what extent would I be able to use this one? How would I make so so irrational can potentially be tied to unpredictable, right? A rational will typically be a predictable thing, right? An irrational will be unpredictable. And there is possibility that uh, if you are unpredictable, you may win because the other side doesn't know how to react. Or and hence, they don't know how to be prepared for, right? So, um, what are the, you know, if I were to take what you discussed further, well, I would ask the questions. So when I adapt, you know, the game theory, uh, what is the rational, be, you know, what, what are the behavioral studies on human being rational and uh, how they are captured in game theory? What are the uh, behavioral studies and cognitive science studies on humans being irrational and how is that captured in game theory? See. The point here is that at some point I would make connection between uh, behavioral science and game theory, right? And and then um, uh, I would try to kind of uh, because we'll have to when we are trying to say I want to make machines intelligent, we'll have to ask the question: What would human do in this case, right? Um, we also are interested, I'm also interested in discussing here what kind of problems machines can do better than humans. Right? And, and I think we have once, you know, we already have examples of that. We clearly have examples of particular problems where machines do better than humans, right? It's been proven, right? Gunvi, give me an example. Predictive modeling, I would say. No, no, but there are very good, good, you know, big high flying examples where they routinely beat the big uh, uh, human experts. Faster, yeah. Computations. Alpha Go. Alpha Go is the latest example. Right? You need to read news, general knowledge, at the minimum. I think everybody knows probably here at Alpha right? Huh? Even the image recognition. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's true. So, uh, and, and it's really interesting. Guys, wait, let's pay attention. In last, just last few years, we are seeing more and more examples of superhuman performance. Okay? What meaning that? It, well, what does it mean? It does better, first it does better than human, average human, then it does better than the <coughs> best in the class, you know, experts, so-called experts in those, those fields, right? You know, obviously chess uh, was, uh, you know, machines uh, uh, did better you know, than humans in chess uh, a few years ago. Now it came to AlphaGo. The question for us to ask is, you know, You'll find, now here is a homework to think about in case you can't answer this right away. What are very simple questions where still uh, there is no hope for machines doing better than you? There are some relatively interesting complex problems. AlphaGo is not an easy game. And, yeah, and, and machine is better than human on a really complex problem. You know, for I, I'm, not, I'm not going to become AlphaGo expert in my lifetime. <coughs> But there are routine things that I could be doing that humans, uh, that machines still can't do better. But huh? humans have that sound Sometimes by that we can take a decision and we do right. more. Yeah, uh, that's right. But there's a lot more, you know, basic and simple things to talk about here. Probably a free will. Hmm? Free will. Human has the free will to do anything or choose any option, but machine doesn't have that. Okay. Creativity. Okay, uh, so all these are fine, uh, but uh, come with something very basic. Emotions. Sense of self. 
anything that is to be done for another human. So uh, it can be without any rule by human, but okay. computer is only based on. Okay. Uh, I, uh, okay. I think I think we are not going where I want to go, uh, and where there are some better answers. Uh, the answers are not necessarily wrong. I want you to think about some simple things that humans do that every average human does that still machines can't do. <coughs> no, come back in the next class. So I, I don't want to answer now. So think about it. There's discussion on that. If you paid attention to the class, uh, you know, all of you are required to go all the way bottom from the bottom to now, right? And I'm going to start asking who has not done that. But, um, and, and, and in particularly, all of you who are, you know, uh, some of you guys are relatively, um, if you're in the first two years, you must do that. Right? Go all the way. Uh, you need to go through all the discussions we had in the last class. Um, there is no time. You guys, nobody has time to go through all of them in detail. So I may have linked to a one-hour video, and I don't expect that you would have seen all the videos for which we have put the link. That's not the idea. But I do want you to know what is the summary. You know, at the abstract level, I want you to know everything that we discussed in the past class. Right? Anyway, come up with some very simple thing that humans do but machines don't do well? Communication. Well, yes, but that is, that, that's where the Turing test is and, uh, you know, uh, there, there will be a lot of discussion and work in that area, right? Okay, so, so come, come, you know, uh, everybody should be ready with the answer in the next class. Just, just reflect on that, right? Uh, I suggest, though, that you uh, uh, do... Um, do a search and, and find what, what has been already conversation communications on that area, right? Just like, you know, rather than my trying to do that, uh, if you're talking about cognitive science, I would do search, find Roger Shank's article, and say, hey, let me, let me first, you know, let me use what this very well-informed well person has said before I, you know, spend too much time my imagining mm -hmm. things. Okay, so do that kind of stuff. Some part of it just uh, <coughs> or is busy with the calculation and game, and the other parts are just busy with the food and physical activity and lots of other things. So I think it's somehow it's unfair because if I just train a kid, for example, we have a kid that just do uh, alpha go in his life. After that, we can say okay, we can compare these two. But uh, it's uh, I don't think that. Uh, and we cannot say that the computers beat human. The state of the, uh, you know, it's not comparable because uh, you gave the computer lots of data uh, that the human didn't have and uh, lots of other parameters that I think they're not equal for both. So saying that the one is beating the other is, I think, it's not fair. No, the, the fact is, First, see if it's a fact. Is the fact is a fact. You 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 know you are right. You have right to your opinion, but you don't have a right to your facts, right? So the fact that you know machine beats human in a game that's a fact. It's a now whether it's a fair uh, game for a human versus machine that's a different issue, right? And the what you would what we'll find at least at this stage of our history and evolution of machines and humans is that we'll find problems that machines already can solve better than human, and we'll find problems uh, that machines still can't solve like human, and humans won't you know let machines solve that problem for themselves, right? We'll find both of them. So we need to ask why. And what are those core issues where uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a hindrance for machines yet 
to uh, you know be uh, to 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 either beat or be like a human, right? Th that will come up, right? Brain is a computer, brain is not a computer. That will be one issue to be discussed there. Um, now, uh, who is here who has not signed up? Okay. Hussein, why? I uh, overlooked this. Okay. Um, I also don't see Amir, so I need to have a conversation with him. Um, okay. Um, how would we go about this conversation? So, um, so I have a thought. First of all, the fact that um, you are in one group or another doesn't mean that you are ultimately uh, the, 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 this is the argument you need to make as faithfully as you can. That doesn't mean that you are you do not think, think that that's the case or vice versa, right? What I'm going to ask is that, um, uh, so anyway, Hussein, you'll have to sign up here uh, according to the rule. Uh, and and uh, what I would like you to do is um, to have each side create two groups of three or four person each. Okay, so you decide. Somebody takes leadership and make into one group. So there will be two groups for e this. There will be two groups for this. Okay. And then what we are going to do is um, each group should uh, come up with uh, uh, talking points. Right. So uh, it will be sort of slides with bullet points right, that they want to talk about. So. Um, Within the group, you decide what are your talking points, what are your winning points, what are the arguments why you believe um, you are on this side. Um, we are research students, all of you are research students, so I, uh, I need you to demonstrate that you can do research. That means I don't want you to be say I'm very smart, I'm going to think about it on your own. No, uh, just like when you write a paper, you need to see what are the other things are there in the literature. So make sure that you are informed by these debates. I already shared um, some articles on both the sides, right? you know, but there's a lot more literature out there. There's a lot of debates on there. Right? There are a lot of um, very intelligent people that talk about this thing right now. It's a hot topic. So look at that from a variety of perspectives right? and make your talking point. And yes. The thing about me is that I couldn't decide, you know, should I go in one group? Is it, I couldn't decide which one because both is true and both are wrong, you know. I don't know what to do. Yeah, so you'll have to, you'll have to uh, decide one for the time for initially. Uh, um, after all the four groups are presented, you'll still have a debate. And at that point, you can say, well, I decide I, it, both of them have this, both, you know, there is something in the middle. And, and you come up with that. So in the first time, you argue what points there are for your side. Later on, you are listening to other sides. You may have your own views also and bring up, right? So there, there needs to be uh, you know, some level of competition here. And you want to make sure your group wins. And you want to bring in multiple different ways that you can um, show uh, that this point of view is correct one, right? The brain is a computer. Uh, uh, computer doesn't necessarily have to mean that uh, current computer is as powerful as brain. It's simply, you, you can argue that with the growth we see in the computer, that you can 
see that anything, any decision human is making could be done in foreseeable future. Maybe singularity is 2055, maybe singularity is 2035, whichever you believe, right? So this is singularity and beyond, right? That singularity is that machines will surpass human capabilities. And this is saying, no, that's never going to happen. Right? The singularity debate, so you need to, you know, if you want to research, look at, look at articles and viewpoints on, on singularity, right? And, and, and see what they are saying. Look at um, neuroscience giving you statistics on things. Look at recent research uh, where it's, uh, people argue that it's not about number of neurons, it is something else that decides your, you know, reasoning or and, and, and intellect. So you can ask, you know, you can argue from XYZ, the other party can argue from different perspective and exemplify. Right? So with the four teams, we'll see which one of the four is most impressive, right? And I do urge you to uh, look at diverse point of view because what the way it should happen is that somebody puts forward a neuroscience perspective on one side and the other group is able to uh, say uh, yeah but uh, cognitive science uh, you know and uh, or behavior science has shown this and I don't see how that is happening here right so um, look at you know look at from different perspective and see how what you can argue right the uh, the thing here is that, as also many of you know, our group is generally, while we are computer scientists first, we are, all, all of us are also interdisciplinary researchers, all of the, us, you know, we work with doctors, we work with, um, you know, epidemiologists, we work with other pe people from other areas, right? And hence, you know, Valerie is here, cognitive scientist or psychologist. So, so um, uh, look at being able to, you know, you're also going to convince people from other areas. And so be prepared for that too. So looking at different perspectives would be very good. In the process, I also want you to pay attention to the fact that how do you, by, by working in a team of four people, let's say, how do you quickly divide the work effectively, yet come back and assimilate and as a team you are very powerful than what you can be individually. How the, uh, you know, some of the parts is larger than the whole or whatever that is called, right? How compared to, it's not just four individuals and, you know, it's, it's more than uh, four when four people work together. So. Make sure that you do that. Make sure that you have blue, you know, um, uh, brainstorming. Make sure that you have figured out effective strategies of collaborating. How do you collaborate? Are you going to come here on the board and meet physically? Are you going to um, uh, use Google Doc? Are you going to use uh, Slack? Right? So, so pay attention to how you work in a team because like in your job, when you, when you go in a company, you will have to figure out how do you effectively work. Every company uh, uses different tool. A lot of companies, for example, today use Slack, right? So um, well, you could use that. There are many other tools that are available. There are tools available called Brain Something where it helps you model all your thoughts into, you know, uh, a place, a diagram. You can use that. Mind maps. Mind maps, right. Right? So there are those tools. So think uh, how you're going to do that. So this is a very multifaceted exercise. Right? It's not just there to come up here. I expect you to read on your own in a discipline that you may not be the most expert for, but go deep into that. You may go into algorithmic you know, aspects of it. You may go to psychological aspects of it. You may go to cognitive models and what they say, you may go to, uh, you may 
uh, you need to look at the aspects that is they are opposite to this, right? So if you are looking at Roger Shank's viewpoint, you do need to look at uh, 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 the singularity guy. What is his name? Uh, hmm? who, is, who is the guy who talks about who, what is the first name that comes to mind when you talk about singularity? Stephen Hawking. No. Come on, guys. Come on, come on, come on. He's 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 working now for Google. No? Huh? Not absolute, no. Okay, we need to know that, right? The most important, right? General general knowledge, general knowledge guys. Yeah? Somebody Google and tell me Ruan. It's very easy. Who wrote the book on singularity? It's very simple. Just Google, Google singularity. Ray Cruzel. Huh? Ray Cruzel. Yes. Ray Cruzel. Well done. Right? So, so what I would expect here in this thing is that if I did not talk about Ray, you must, you know, if you did your research, I would expect you to have that knowledge. I would expect what arguments Ray Kuzula has presented. I expect what um, opposing views people have done. You know, you really need to know who are the most influential people on the debate. So I expect that you would know that. I expect the most influential debate on this side, I expect you to do this thing. I expect you to know the books that argue this side. I expect the book that I say. I expect you to see TED talks that talk about this. I expect you to see TED talks about that out of this, right? Today, if you're not seeing, a, if you are preparing debate and you're not seeing the relevant TED talks, well, you're not done your research. I hope you are seeing the dimensions of doing a research, right? and creative thinking. So to, 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 to see, you know, among the things that I've said, and let me just sort of try and organize, I said you really have to think about um, the uh, types of information that you have to research, the people, the, uh, their positions, the counter positions, the people, the books, the TED Talks, all of those things, the technical research papers that are already published on these, these topics. And from multiple facets, neuroscience and behavioral science and uh, other things. Right? And people who talk about rationality and rational thinking and many other things. So you have to do research. Then you need to demonstrate that collectively you can be better than what any one of you individually can do. So you need to say how you're going to collaborate in the team. Then you need to figure out how are you going to present that. You have a half, you have half an hour, or so, or less. How are you going to present what you have? And when you are presenting it, it'll be open um, um, uh, forum in the sense that, as the team is presenting, the four guys are here. Everybody else, anybody else, can ask all the questions. The issue is not only. The, the focus is not only on those who are presenting, the focus is also on the audience and their engagement and their asking questions and their challenging it. Right? And the first team will come, a lot of discussion will happen. Second team will come, a lot of discussion already happened, so it will be harder for the second team. The third team will be even harder and fourth team will be even harder because so much is going, what, what new going to talk about? Right? I also want to see whether any leadership evolves within that sub team, so a team of four people. I want you to compete and cooperate at the same time. It's going to be very clear to me and to the rest how each of you initially thought on this project, on, on this 
topic <coughs> and how you collectively win. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a thing where you need to shine individually and yet you need to collectively also win. And the audience is going to uh, you know, really uh, take you to the task. The audience needs to be very smart because they need to have the questions to ask. They need to puncture the hole into the balloon that is floated here. Right? And uh, I think it's, we're going to have two weeks before the first week, first group starts. Roughly. We may change that, but you know, make sure that uh, you, you kind of understand that you have at least two weeks to um, get going and, and do the research on that. I want to um, I want you to uh, smartly pick out your uh, team. I want you to be smart in make sure making sure that you are part of a good team, winning team. This is very important. <coughs> Many cases, uh, half of you know a good part of your winning is about uh, joining the right team. Uh, I when, when I, I tell my students uh, when they are interviewing with three companies. Uh, I say one of the most important thing you will decide is not the name of the company, not the, you know, um, uh, that, oh, this is a Facebook or this is, uh, you know, Amazon or something. No, don't worry about that. I mean, that's, that's one aspect, but the more important, that's similar to saying, oh, this is Stanford or this CMU and this right set. That's fine. But look at the team that you're going to work in. Who are those specific people that you're going to interact with every day? Right? Uh, how fun, how enjoyable, how informative, how grow, grow, you know, which team will allow you to grow much better and you'll be stronger? Which team is more welcoming to you? Those are the things that you need to do. That is a smart thing. Show me that. Show me how each of the four that is formed or five that you may have in the group. How do you, um, you know, I want, I want you to realize if nobody picks you in the group, what's happening, what's wrong with you, and why you are not being picked. And a question really, if, if, if you are not getting into a team, or, or you are not joining the team, or you, you tell somebody, hey, can we form a team, and they say, let me think about it. I want you to, and that's fine, that's what you should do, you should be, this, uh, you know, um, uh, you need to be uh, that corporate versus what was it? So, so I think you need to play that game, right? And you know, I mean, uh, as a team, you need to think that you are don't pick up a very weak member who you think would not um, uh, carry their group. I I want to see if there is one team that is just of quote unquote losers who nobody else took them, so they just form a team. I want you to, uh, you know, see that you're not part of that. So sh show your smartness. I want you to understand from this very important thing. You're winning, and winning in a sense, very positive sense, success. It's not just going to be the fact that you are um, working very hard or you think you are smart. Your winning is also going to be your acceptance by others. I want you to understand that. I want you to understand when you don't work well with others or when you know that somebody, your other people are avoiding you, you need to figure out a way. You need to learn to say sorry and uh, figure out a way to, uh, you know, uh, start again if that is the case. If I were the person who, uh, for whatever reason, feel I'm left out, feel that I had uh, you know bad relations with my colleagues, uh, and I should be cooperating. I'm you know I'm supposedly working on the same project. What I will do, smart thing, is to really uh, uh, you know say sorry. Let the bygones be bygone. I am going to play well. I I learned my lesson. Uh, you know take me as a thing. Because remember, in this game that we're going to play, you're not going to win by being alone and smart going to be winning, you, you, that you'll have to do, we are going to win by being part of the group that will collaborate most and come with the most, uh, you know, 
cohesive um, uh, 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 argument and, and most cohesive kind of um, uh, theory of, of why this is the case. Most cohesive set of arguments, right? Also, you being part of the right group means you're going to enjoy the process. Otherwise, you're not going to enjoy the process. And you're going to, you're, you know, if you're peace through your year for three, four, five, six years and you're not enjoying, what's the fun? That's not, I, I really want you to have a fantastic experience of, of your PhD. And that will be if you enjoy. And uh, it, it, to a good part, you'll enjoy only if you make friends here. You don't have to have everything, 100% of the people as a friend. You need to be civil to 100% of people. But you want to have a few friends. You want to be able to go for coffee with them and discuss stuff. Then you'll be really enjoying your life here. Right? So there are a lot of things that are going to happen here. Right? All right. Yes. It's nine on the right hand side, so basically it's five and four. Uh, no, there, uh, so there's Hussein, but uh, there will be, uh, I guess, I'll have to put, um, um, uh, I'll have to put Amir here also. So, so yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I'll see, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, suppose the two groups are formed of 4-4, four, four, the other two will have to figure out a way and they'll, they'll have to go to, you know, both cannot go to one group, so they'll have to beg to the group uh, to take them in, you know, or whatever they have to happen. Or I, I have to throw, I, you know, or they are default by that, but that's a, that's a, that's a loss. If you're the last one to be admitted to a group, um, then that's a loss. I don't want you to stick to your existing uh, social friends either. I don't want the 365 to have their own just group <laughs> necessarily either. I want you to open up. I want you to be accepting to uh, you know uh, uh, new things, especially if you get uh, you know through the thing that I said about. So 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 that that will show the being uh, you know a large heart rate is also a winning strategy. And anyway, you need you need diversity. You know, the two fundamental aspects: diversity and adaptability. So, Shriyas can give you all kinds of things about diversity in wisdom of crowds, right? So, yeah, that's so you need that diversity. You can't be all K-Health project group anyway, or, or, or one or the other, right? So, yeah, I want to see that. I want these guys to feel completely at home, uh, even though they're not part of, uh, you know, the novices group. So they, they need to be welcomed into that. Maybe you guys need to try and go into separate uh, group to get you know diversity kind of thing. So that may also be the uh, thing. All right. Uh, you want both the same side, Saravia and <coughs> some other yeah, you both sides. So you go to different groups there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just curious. Hmm. I don't know if you have already talked about it, but you told me to remind you about. Uh, uh, that you would tell the class about the difference between uh, semantic cognition and perceptual uh, thinking mm -hmm. when we previously um, So, uh, on my slides uh, for my keynote, I have slides that define them. Mm -hmm. Did you review them? Yes, but you said that uh, you had some specific points which you, you you wanted to tell the class. Okay, I forgot. <laughs> so I'll have to see if I can recall what it, you know, uh, I will say. Um, I can I can go through so slides and explain how I see them different to be different. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can do that. Um, I'll, I'll probably do it later. Okay, so who is going on Thursday? You. And who is going to go on Tuesday? 
next week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and um, any other questions? Thoughts? Um, I found so then. Uh, let's. Is it time or? Okay. So I'm just going to uh, take one or. Uh, I'm just going to uh, float um, an idea, uh, something that I want to uh, share with you. That's on my mind. Um, I was uh, talking to. Uh, I was looking at um, uh, Hypertext, and they have a new session for Blue Sky. Papers and uh, and I you know put down something on a Google Doc and send it to TK and say let's talk about it and the the topic that I I talked about it had was a sort of extrapolation of um, uh, uh, this uh, work. Relationships at the do you guys remember the ER keynote? ER two thousand eight keynote? You mean the relationship at the heart of semantic world? Yeah. It says 79, but each of them probably could be. article relationship but there is a Relationship web. I can't find my presentation. It should be online somewhere. So in this present, in this talk, um, I talked about how we go from uh, keywords and uh, you know um, uh, strings to um, entities and things to relationships, and then on to um, um, uh, and then on to kind of understanding of events and situational awareness and that kind of thing, and. One perspective of how we are m making the world more you know, richer, right, is, and, and you know the, the the analogy is like on a search engine we used to do keyword search, and now the search engines are uh, 
uh, more able to understand objects and entities, like name people and organization and so on and so forth, right? Uh, place, people, <coughs> and uh, organizations, and these are some of the fundamental types of objects that um, most knowledge graph have, and hence they understand as things very well. And other types of esoteric objects they don't know. They're not typed it yet. So they don't know that well, but they are going there. And the next aspect in, in evolution, let's say search engines and many other things, would be better understanding of relationship. That has already started to happen. For example, uh, the search engine like Google, because they have specific knowledge graph for health, they already have the schema for uh, a disease and symptom. So those relationships are known by the search engine, and hence they understand that. Right? Now, the hypothesis, the, the, the point that I'm making is that uh, we are going to, we are moving towards richer representation of sim relationships. That the machine, whether it's a search engine or any other algorithm, is uh, going towards richer modeling of relationship, richer understanding of relationships. Right? So if I say, you take um, a schooner, uh, our tool that goes from one concept to another concept via a relationship, right? What relationship? Where is the specific modeling of relationship? So there's a schema that will tell you that I have this relationship type. If I'm, an op if I, if I'm at the entity of this type, these are the relationship type that it parts in. So suppose I'm an employee type entity. Then I have a relationship type like employee works for a company or organization. Employee owns stocks in a company or organization. Okay? So you have relationship types associated with this company, you know, thing, right? Okay. Now, understand that um, in any graph, there are far more number of edges compared to the nodes. So the number of relationships, not necessarily types, but the instances are going to be far larger. Right? Now, if you think about real world, if you think about our world as a human, we are very adept at doing the trailblazing across many types of relationships. Right? The other day, I was talking about the example that I may have cultural affinity when I'm traveling somewhere in remote part of the world and I find somebody who is an Indian, I you know, will introduce myself or that person will want to talk to me. If I'm in Timbuktu and you know, there's nobody looking like me, everybody speaking different languages, I find one person who I think may be speaking my language, I'll associate that, right? I mean, also because of cultural affinity, Sometimes you may find affinity, even if it's no close, it's not a, a Gujarati, the guy who speaks my home language or English, and, and, and you know, even that person speaks Telugu but looks like me or Sinhala looks my, like me, I'll still, you know, find an affinity, right? A relationship of a particular type. But the point here is that now, ask this question. What kind of question, what kind of relationship we are already modeling in the traditional knowledge graphs that we currently create? We create relationships as in ownership relationship. We create relationship as in location. We create relationship as in uh, a domain like health. Right? So the, the, the proposition that I have is that the types of relationships that our systems will understand is going to grow and explode. Okay. And so there is a um, there's a book about written by uh, psychologists and you know other people in social science about relationship. And they are not talking about the relationship in the formal sense of you know what we do in computer science and age label age. They are talking about saying. They're categorizing family, familial relationships. They can, you know, all the things, and husbands, and wives, and son, and daughter, and nephew, and niece, and everything like that. Right? That, that's, that's the type of relationship, right? Some of you may uh, look at verbotem, and some of you look at the work uh, uh, from which uh, CO ontology was developed. Right? 
So that's an ontology of relationships. Right? And the type of relationship in that are far more diverse, are more diverse because they come, they, this didn't, it didn't come from the type of relationship as categorized by computer scientists. It came from people in other fields, linguistics, and people working on linguistics, people working on social science. They, they, they come up with the relationship, right? But they are important, right, in the real world. And that I believe that we are, will be making conscious progress towards incorporating those diverse kind of relationships into a computational network, you know, infrastructure. And that will make it more humanistic. Right? <clears throat> now, people on the computer is a brain, uh, brain is a, you know, uh, they can argue that I can put those relationships in that and it will become intelligent. Or, see, or the other guys can argue differently. But uh, uh, the, the richness that, uh, of the system that will, that will get to by more explicitly bringing in relationship types is what will make the next uh, you know, kind of generation of rich, uh, richer hypertext system, richer web. Uh, so in this case, I just think about relationship web. I, the, uh, the term I use is relationship web. Okay, and, and I'm I'm kind of try try to take that general idea forward. Okay. Well, that was my site. Uh, it's only available in YouTube. Hmm? YouTube. Um, our YouTube, uh, uh, yeah, no, <coughs> relationship work. Is it noises or noise center? Just remove the noises. Uh, huh? Just remove the noises. Oh. And YouTube is such a relationship work. That's not the one. But yeah, this one. Yeah, this one. Yeah, that's yeah. That's. So it's a class that I. Yeah, this is. So uh, today we're going to talk about. I was looking for this presentation. I don't know. I couldn't find. But you can see relationship web trail blazing, analytics and computing for human experience. And uh, so that is a you know that should be somewhere, I'm, I'm, uh, but uh, maybe maybe it is in our slide share for noises. So the slide share link is also available if you scroll. Oh, okay, okay, all right. So that's. Uh, so. Okay, this was I was looking for this and I couldn't find it in that one. Strange. Anyway. So, so, um, uh, and you know, uh, what I was talking about is uh, this little thing here, right? And and what I'm, what I see happening possibly is that explicit recognition of this type in the web infrastructure, in the you know, could make our information systems more uh, richer and. Smarter, right? Smarter in the sense of really being able to understand all these nuances of how things relate to each other. Right? It's through relationship where you get to gain power. Who do you know? The network, the right kind of network. So that's that's what. So anyway, that's that's a, a thinking that um, try to um, um, explore the way uh, machines can be uh, made more aware of the things. So. Um, if I wanted to, if I wanted to capture a lot of facts, right? I would uh, raid, I would take um, uh, Wikipedia and uh, get all the facts that, quote unquote, and, and there, there are there, right? I would uh, take the database uh, in a particular domain, 
uh, if I wanted to talk about restaurants, I will take the whole uh, as much as if I if I can get access to all the uh, Foursquare database and so on and so forth, right? And I will by having that database, uh, I'll know the cuisine of a restaurant. I will see so I know the location. I will know you know how people like all those things we would have, right? So there, what did I do? I made my system smarter with regards to a lot of factual data, but the facts are entity-centric. The relationships are there very limited, saying the restaurant has this, restaurant has this location, restaurant has this thing, right? But they're not going across many other things. They're not capturing um, a lot of nuances that these entities participate in. Going to the kind of because uh, you know the human brain, our trailblazing is very rich because when we are doing trailblazing, when we are traversing relationship, we are we have ability to naturally, uh, you know, resort to and you you know be able to exploit many understand and use many types of relationship. That's my theory, right? And that that makes uh, our thinking process very rich. How, if for the machine to become, machines quote unquote thinking to be that rich, you do need to make it more aware of them. Right? That these two people are related to each other by a work relationship. These two people are related to each other by a family relationship. And the concept of work relationship versus family relationship should be clear, uh, available to you, right? And how much work is done in that area? My feeling is not much. And my feeling is that bringing that relationship, those, that, that, that exclusive way of thinking about it would be very valuable. I had made a, um, uh, an attempt in the past called MREF, which was not very successful. One of my uh, uh, you know, big disappointments in life is that I think there was a very powerful concept, but somehow, um, I couldn't work deep enough in that, and I couldn't find it, you know. Uh, I was very busy with my company then, and I didn't have PhD students looking at working at that thing, so the time kind of passed. But anyway, so uh, I've been thinking about relationship quite, uh, you know, all the time, and that's where uh, I think some uh, interesting work remains to be done. Okay. Anyway, so that was a two days, that was two days <coughs> Follow up.